Hey guys, and welcome to Petrol Pet, and welcome to this week's Midweek 180. Well, I am feeling a little bit better this week, although I'm still not 100%, but I can breathe through my nose for the first time in about two weeks. But a massive thanks to everyone who sent messages of sympathy for my, my current condition. And it sounded like plenty of you have had the lurgy for about the same time as me. It, it's properly miserable, put it that way. Um, but I am getting better, um, although I, am, I was due to be at a couple of events this week I've had to postpone because I'm just not up to uh, 100% speed. But I'll hopefully get there, and I need to because I've got a really busy week next week but I'm, I'm fit enough to do a midweek 180. Um, but lots and lots to talk about this week, but let's get the housekeeping out the way first. So leader of the pack last week was Francois G. Well done, mate. Joined in the Magnificent Seven by Michael Kember, Leanne Jackson, Rod Matheson, Paul Mead, Jake Warren, and Kevin DG7. So whoever puts the first comment this week, you'll be my leader of the pack next week, and the first seven comments will be in my Magnificent Seven. Where are you and what you're doing? That was Global Nomad, who was being global. Uh, he was in a hotel in Bilbao, Spain, uh, on a study trip with the school. But wherever you are right now, and whatever you're doing, put it in the comments below, and I'll give you a shout out next week. Uh, last week's question was about whether you use the native sat-nav in your car, or do you pair a smartphone using, I don't know, CarPlay or Android Auto. An interesting mix. A lot of you who said you use the native sat-nav did so so you could get the navigation instructions up on a head-up display, which is a shortcoming of uh, using a, a, a paired phone, uh, CarPlay or Android Auto. Um, and I kind of get that, actually. Um, personally, I'm a big Waze fan. I'll use Waze whenever I can. Um, this week's question, I just wondered how many of you follow me on my other social media channels? Do you follow me on Instagram? and Facebook, they're my two main ones because I put lots of other content on there, stories and reels, behind the scenes stuff. So it kind of complements what you see on YouTube. Um, I don't really do so much on Twitter anymore and I'm not of the age demographic to use shit, sorry, TikTok. Um, so I don't use TikTok, but I do plenty of stuff on Facebook and Instagram and I am trying really hard to grow those channels. So if you don't follow me on those platforms, it would be amazing if you did. Uh, Formula E from the weekend just by, wow, what? So there were two races, um, really, really interesting. So in race one, it ended up being won by my mate, Ollie Rowland in the Nissan, but that was only because the Porsche of Antonio Felix da Costa was disqualified for a technical infringement. And I have to say, I think it was a little bit harsh. It was all down to a throttle spring. Apparently at the beginning of the season, all the cars are supplied by Formula E, and they were supplied with the old throttle spring because the manufacturer of the spring couldn't make enough springs for everybody quick enough for the beginning of the season. So there was a bit of leeway where you could use the old one or the new one. But then once there was enough new springs around, they, they changed the 170 page catalogue that basically details all the bits of kit that you have to run in the car. They changed the catalogue and didn't tell anybody. So Porsche was still using the old spring it had no performance gain at all, but it was an illegal part and therefore they disqualified the car. And I think that is a bit harsh. I think a slap on the back of the wrist would have been good enough. Don't do it again kind of thing. And then in the second race, it was looking amazing for Ollie Rowland going into the last lap. He was in the lead, he'd run a great race and then suddenly the car pulled to one side and he ran out of energy. And apparently there was a technical fault on the car. So the car calculates how many laps they've done and they kind of, the driver and the car, work out what their energy consumption per lap is gonna be. And what happened when the car passed the start finish line on the first lap, it basically miscounted the amount of laps. So as, as the car started its penultimate lap, the car thought that was, that was it, the race done. So it, it, it had basically a lap, not enough energy. Um, and that uh, meant the car, Stopped. <laughs> gutting for Ollie, absolutely gutting. Pascal Verlein won the second race, which is good because it's driving a Porsche and that maybe made it a little bit of a, a less painful weekend for Porsche having won the second race and having had the first race taken away from them. Um, but yeah, really, really good uh, racing from Formula E. Formula One heads to China this weekend. Very, very much looking forward to that. First time in China for a few years now with F1. Let's hope somebody can take it to the Red Bulls. Otherwise, it's going to be really boring. But my motorsport fix this weekend came from the Goodwood members meeting and what, a, what an event it was. The, the weather gods were kind uh, and we were treated to some amazing action on track. 
I guess from a kind of modern day car perspective, the really interesting one for me was the Gordon Murray T50S made its dynamic debut. So that's the T50 is the three seat Gordon Murray with the 11,000 RPM V12 Cosworth, but the T50S is the, the track oriented version of that, the Nicky Lauda Special. Boy, did it sound good. I mean, and it was spitting flame and oh, it was just an amazing sounding car. But they also ran the T33 Mule. Now the T33 is Gordon Murray's two seater, same engine, slightly lower RPM, and it's like about a million quid cheaper than T50. That sounded really good as well. But the stars of the show for me, well, actually, the, I think the motorbike and sidecars were just mental. <laughs> I never really, I was looking with my big brother, uh, one of the, the sidecars with all the bodywork taken off, and he honestly sit there for 20 minutes looking, trying to work out where the rider goes, and the, the passenger sits on a tea tray at the back with a couple of grab handles absolutely mental um, but the can-am cars were just magnificent hold on that'll be the harvard flying over the can-am cars were just amazing can-am race series was back end of the 60s very early 70s um, and it was one of the few race series ever to have had no rules the only, actually that's not true, the only rule was you had to run a V8, but everything else was whatever you wanted. And the diversity of cars that were designed were just unbelievable. And they had a whole bunch of cars flown over from America, shadow uh, uh, cars, and some of them were just amazing. And you look under the bodywork and their driver safety was zero. I mean, they were just unbelievable things. They looked like basically a go-kart with a massive V8 stuck on the back, terrifying. Sounded amazing, just so good to see them running. Um, and then the last few bits of update, uh, big response to me announcing my latest Hendy Group long term is a Lotus Emira, the supercharged V6 manual version. Uh, I am settling in well with the car. I've had a couple of nice drives in it so far. Um, I've got videos planned uh, coming to the channel very soon. Uh, I'm gonna do a side-by-side -side comparison with my Boxster. I know my Boxster is a convertible, um, but I think Boxster came on such a similar platform and they are natural competitors to the Amira. So I think it'd be very interesting. Quite a few of you asked for me to do that comparison. And then I'm also gonna take the Lotus to some really special roads, uh, take it on a bit of a road trip because it's such a cool car. It gets so much attention, super car looks. That's all I'll say. I've had another puncture. <laughs> so the predecessor to the Lotus, my Vauxhall Astra long-termer, I had three punctures in as many weeks in that car. Uh, and then would you believe it, the Mini had a slow puncture last week and I took it to my good mates at ProTire in Southbourne um, on Monday and it had a slow puncture because of basically what looked like a split pin uh, in one of the treads, but it was so close to the sidewall Basically, the tire was shot. We couldn't fix it, which was annoying because when I did the Mini with Darren at Mulgaru, we, we basically powder coated the wheels and put brand new Michelin Pilot Sport 5 tires on them. So those tires had done probably, I don't know, 500 miles, not even that. Uh, so very, very annoying, but I managed to source another tire the next day and it's all back and running now. So Mini's back again <laughs> after another puncture, that's four punctures. Um, and then uh, this Friday at six, I got a really interesting car. Um, I reckon it should keep the, the petrol heads happy and the electro heads happy because it's a car with a, an all-electric drivetrain, but it has a rotary, petrol-powered rotary engine as a, a, a generator stroke range extender. Um, and it's a Mazda MX-30 REV. It's a plug-in hybrid, but honestly, I think it's one of the most interesting cars I've driven in a, in a good while, actually. It's, the drivetrain is so interesting, so much to talk about when you drive it. But from a stylistic point of view, I think the car looked great, really nice interior. It was a really nice car to spend a week with. So I'm really hoping uh, that you enjoy that one because I enjoyed having it. But anyway, like that, I'm going to love you and leave you. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, give me a thumbs up. Comments below are always welcome. And if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to Petroped for plenty more content to come. Remember, please follow me on Instagram and Facebook if you're not already doing so. And I will see you on Friday at 6 for the Mazda MX-30 REV. The best plug-in hybrid I've driven. But it's kind of a battery electric plug-in hybrid petrol 